excuse me, but we have to start. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Welcome to the Unitarian Universalist Church of Spokane, where our mission is to join together to create a nourishing, liberal religious home and to champion justice, diversity, and environmental stewardship in our wider world. Or as we say in short, to create community, find meaning, and work for justice. Welcome to one and all. It's great to have you here this morning. I want to begin, as always, by embracing all that you bring with you to this space, all of your uniqueness, your beliefs, your background, your lifestyle, your differences, all that helps make you who you are is welcome here. And this, of course, includes those who hear me say this often each Sunday, as well as those who might be joining us for the first time today. You're equally as welcome here this morning. So welcome to one and all. Welcome to those who are streaming with us. We're also glad to know that you're with us. So thank you so much. I uh, want to just make a couple of quick announcements and then let you take a few more minutes to say hi to one another this morning. One, you've noticed we're having our annual holiday craft fair in the friendship area. And so I know you're just anxious to get out there and look around. And I'm sorry that I'm interrupting that, but uh, you will have time to do so during our social hour. So please do. And then I also wanted to uh, remind you that uh, uh, we, we are going to have our annual Christmas Eve service, our Cosmic Advent service, at least on Christmas Eve, December 24th at 6 p.m. It's uh, really an ex extraordinary ritual that rather than focusing on the, the advent of the birth of one person, it focuses on the advent of the birth of everything. It's the Cosmic Advent, the advent of the universe. And, and it uses uh, literature from various traditions from around the world, as well as traditional uh, 
Christmas songs right out of our own hymnal. So it's a, it's a really quaint uh, ritual, I think, that a lot of us have come to appreciate on that uh, service, and we're glad to offer it again. So please feel free to come to that if you're able. Okay, so with that said, let's do take a few moments to greet one another. As always, I hope that you will say hi to those you look forward to seeing each Sunday and make some new friends today. And uh, if you are joining us for the first time, if you uh, can help not being too shy, uh, we would appreciate it because we're very glad you're here. And that was a two gonger. <laughs> but again, there'll be more opportunity to visit uh, during our social hour, so I hope you will. But let's go ahead and move forward with our service now by lighting our chalice, the symbol of our faith, the symbol of our unity and our solidarity, of our openness and our inclusion of our community and our individual uniqueness. May this small flame be our offering of warmth to those who are cold and alone and a light to those in darkness. May it be a flame that ignites justice in our world, and a beacon of hope to those in need, and may it reflect at least a spark of truth wherever truth has been lost, and cast a healthy shadow of doubt wherever it's been found. The introductory words are an excerpt from an article written in Entertainment. Heroes and villains have been with us since, well, day one, when God and the devil emerged <coughs> down in the original white and black hats. Good guys and bad have been around since the birth of pop culture as well. The first official movie blockbuster 
Well, something of a Batman versus Joker superhero saga, a provocative reflection of its time's epic about caped crusaders who were horned masks and a mad rogue who wore makeup. Nearly a century later, stories about heroes and villains have never been more popular. Kids and parents alike have been mesmerized by the literary and cinematic clashes between Harry Potter and his nemesis Voldemort. And then there's Spider-Man, Batman. We desperately want good to triumph over evil. Our first in-service hymn of the morning is actually a favorite of mine. I have to work hard not to uh, program it too often. <laughs> and, uh, but Todd and I had a talk about this service, and guess what? We both thought it would be good for this one. Um, so please rise to sing number 134, Our World is One World. for all ages and I'd like to especially invite the young and young at heart to come and sit down in front. Young at heart we have. Oh good. So nice to see you guys here. It was fun to have the snow outside, right? Yeah. Does anybody know what this is? Close but not quite. What is it? No. A pelican, that's right. Have any of you seen pelicans before? On the coast? Is it a brown pelican? Okay, there's, there's in our country, there's two different kinds of pelicans. Um, brown pelicans that live largely along the coast. And then there's the white pelicans that live inland largely. They do freshwater fishing, and these are generally saltwater fishers. So um, there are some special things. Whoops, there's some special things about pelicans. Um, one of it is that they have these huge pouches. And it doesn't look very big now, right? And on a, even a regular one, they kind of tuck it in like this until they're going around and they're swimming and they want to scoop up fish. But when they scoop up fish, they also scoop up water. And they don't want to swallow the water because it would make them sick to their stomach. So what they do is they have this big, big gullet full of water and fish. And they 
they squirt out the water out the side of their mouth, and then they can swallow the fish. So they're really special, and I have a special kinship for pelicans. I grew up a lot in Florida. I'll put them down here this time. I um, grew up in Florida, and there's a lot of pelicans there. But this is a once upon a time type story. So the title is The Three Pelicans. Once upon a time, an old woman lived in a fishing village. Her husband had been a fisherman, but he had been killed in an accident. That was a long time ago, but she still loved him and missed him very much. She was alone, but the townspeople were really good to her. They made certain she always had food, that the wood pile was never empty so she could stay warm, and her home was free of leaks and drafts. She was really grateful for all of the good things they did. And she was a good person. She tried to keep herself busy. Every day, or almost every day after she finished her morning cup of tea, she would walk down to the main center of town, to the marketplace, and get a grip, some fish scraps as so she could find them. She would talk to the people on her way down the road, and then she would go to the dock. And on the dock, she would watch the fishing boats go in and out. She would maybe read. She would maybe knit. But there was one thing that was always around there were the pelicans. And so she kind of liked these pelicans because they were very polite. They didn't talk. And they listened to her. <laughs> Go figure that one. So she used the pelican. She told them some wonderful stories about when she was a little girl growing up along the coast, about how great her husband was, and how nice the people in the town were. And, you know, she didn't care. She didn't think they could understand her, but they were polite, so this was really cool. And she was charmed by these birds and grew to like them and think of them as friends. And so as she was walking along on a street or on the coast, she would see them flying along fishing because they fly in single file, and they would, she would wave to them. And she imagined they were kind of waving back at her. But at this point, it became fall. And the leaves were turning color, was getting a little bit colder. And one day, she hurried down from her house. Now, she was a little old woman, and she didn't necessarily run really fast. But the pelicans were surprised that she was coming down. She had a big smile on her face, and she had a bag. And she came and she sat down next to them. And she pulled out a ball of yarn. And she said, you know, I got to thinking. I had made some beautiful sweaters for my husband. But after he died, I folded them up and put them in a trunk. And they weren't good to anybody. And there are people out here right now who are very cold. They need to have something to stay warm. So I thought, and I went home, and I unraveled all the sweaters that I had made for my husband so I could make scarves for the people in town. And so she got to knitting. She was knitting these scarves, and the pelicans were just amazed at how fast those needles could go. And she would make a scarf lickety-split, and she would pull it up to show them, and then she would quickly put it away so the townspeople wouldn't see what she was doing. Shh! Don't tell anybody, she said. And you know what? The pelicans really did understand her, and they kept her secret. And they were fascinated by this new project, and they watched as more and more scarves were being made, and she was putting them away. And, you know, she was getting pretty excited, and they were really interested in this project. Well, now, the days were getting colder, and they were getting darker, and the nights were getting longer. Then one day, when there were just a few pelicans around, the old woman exclaimed, Done! I got them all ready. And so she got up, she stuck, stuck them in the bag, she went home to wrap them to give to the people. She wanted to make a surprise for them. She wanted to put them on the porch overnight. Well, that night, the three pelicans saw her leave the cottage. The full moon was shining brightly, lighting her way down the path. And she was bundled up against the cold, and she was walking along. And all of a sudden, plop. A present fell from her bag. Uh-oh, there was a hole in her sack. And every once in a while, another present would drop to the ground. Quick, the 
but let's we got to do something. So they first where they were watching her, and they went down and they started picking up the bundles one by one with their beak and put them in their pouch, and they were walking down. Pelicans are not very graceful when they walk, and but they were walking trying to catch up with her. Finally, a street, and she put her hand in the pocket, and oh, there were no more presents there. I must have left some at home. And she was turning, getting ready to go, running back, and she looked up and she saw the pelicans walking towards her with a bag. When they got up to her, they stopped, and each one dropped the packages at her feet. One, two, three, four, five, six packages. <gasps> that was exactly the number that she needed. How did they know what could what? What she was kind of scratching her head, and so she, you know, she was picking them up and she looked at them and said, "Thank you so very much." How did you know? I, I she was dumbfounded. She was beside herself, and so she stood up and she said, "Thank you one more time," and the pelicans tipped their beak. Because they didn't say anything, don't you know? They turned around with a hop and a skip. They lifted up into the air and flew away. They flew around her once, and then flew off into the dark night. The presents now safely in her bag, she went down and finished the last of the presents at the houses. Ah, home at last. That was a lot of work. Can you imagine going and giving each person a present at their house? And she opened the door to her home and walked in. She was tired, but she was happy. And she was wondering, what happened? Did I really see that with the pelicans? She did. But before slipping off to sleep, she promised to herself that the next day she would go to the fish market and get the biggest batch of fish scraps that she could manage to take down to the birds on the dock. It's time to sing our children out. We light the second chalice so that as our children and youth go to their chapels, they carry the light of our flame with them. May it illuminate, inspire, and warm you as it does us. We have a special collection this morning, and as always, you can uh, use the envelope in your order of service if you care to contribute. Don't start passing it now yet. I've got, I've got more to say. <laughs> Hold on. Hold on. <laughs> this is a special, special collection uh, because it's for uh, the minister's discretionary fund, uh, what we informally call the sharing fund because that's mostly what I use it for, to Share your generosity with others who are in our community who every now and then run into some sort of financial hur hurdle they can use a little bit of help with. So uh, I always appreciate all that you give to this fund. I, I, uh, I have to say I almost always give it away before uh, I ask you to help me resupply, and that's the case here. Uh, but I certainly enjoy uh, extending your generosity through this fund, so I want to thank you in advance and ask you to uh, contribute if you're willing and able this morning. So we do now gratefully give and receive this morning's offering, which helps sustain our community and our mission to the larger world. Okay, go ahead. <laughs>
Thank you, Michalina. We're now going to kindle our candles of care for those who are most on our hearts and minds this morning. I did receive uh, one candle of care, and uh, it's, a, it's a bit longer than the uh, candles I usually uh, request, I usually read, but we only have one today, and, and under the, uh, the circumstances, I th- I'd like to read this entire thing this morning. Uh, I think it's important to hear. Uh, this is from Rhonda, uh, church member Rhonda McDowell. Uh, Rhonda McDowell's husband, Brad, 63 years old, has been battling aggressive prostate cancer for over four years. In mid-November, active treatment was discontinued, and he was enrolled in hospice at home, which is which has provided much-needed comfort care. Both of their daughters, Laura, 28, in Seattle, and Amy, 23, in Portland, have arranged to be at home for the duration. Upon hospice notification, Laura moved up her 2020 wedding date to last month, pulling together a small, lovely ceremony over Thanksgiving weekend so that her father could officiate. Much appreciated support has also come from Brad's eight siblings who've taken turns flying in from the Midwest, friends at UU, wonderful neighbors, and from the staff at Sturm Heating and Air, where Brad has worked for 10 plus years, who have become like family. Although he can barely talk above a whisper due to a chronic dry cough, Brad still has Rhonda driving him to work for a few hours most days so that he can finish training his replacement. Let's take a moment of silence now on behalf of others you might be thinking of, and as always, you're welcome to name them aloud at this time if you'd like. Those named aloud and those embraced in our silence and all those who are suffering in our world at this hour, we hold in our community with compassion. I wrote the following words for the Little Nature Chapel. We are the heroes of our own stories and strive to make a difference in a world full of challenges. Beyond the pain, beyond the darkness, we have the power to be instruments of healing, messengers of light, and to extend a hand of love to all who need it most. Namaste.
For our reading today, I invite you to turn to number 662 in the back of your gray hymnal, number 662 for a responsive reading. I'll begin today and ask our entire congregation to be our respondents. Number 662. The years of all of us are short, our lives precarious. Yet we find time for bitterness, for petty treason and evasion. Here we are, all of us, all upon this planet, bound together in a common destiny. Kindred in this, each lighted by the same precarious, flickering flame of life, how does it happen that we are not kindred in all things else? Thanks again, John, for your heart and your talent.
Most stories need a hero or a villain. A hero and a villain, I should say. A, a good guy and a bad guy. A protagonist and an antagonist. But if we observe their behaviors alone, it's often difficult to distinguish the difference between the two. Take the almost archetypal images of Luke Skywalker, Luke Skywalker and Darth Vader from Star Wars. Were it not for the fact that one wears white and the other black, typical Hollywood indicators of their roles, their actions are a lot alike. Darth Vader uses the force and a lightsaber against his enemies. Luke Skywalker uses the force and a lightsaber against his enemies. The only difference between them really is the side that they're on. From the storyteller's perspective, Luke is considered the hero because he's fighting for the rebellion and Vader is the villain because he's fighting for the empire. But again, both sides use the same weapons, blasters and starfighters, to kill each other. The ways they behave, the ways they treat each other, the ways they achieve their goals are the same. No wonder Luke Skywalker sees his own face beneath the mask of Darth Vader. But if the story were told from the Empire's perspective, their roles would be flipped. Vader would be the hero because he's reestablishing order by destroying terrorist rebels. This is true of most of the stories that we tell ourselves. Be they fictional stories, real stories, or the stories of our own lives. Those who are on our side of the issues are its heroes, and those who aren't are its villains. The only difference is which side we think we're on. And most of us consider ourselves the heroes of our stories because we're sure we are the ones who have the right ideas and values, even though our tactics are altogether alike, I should say, those whose ideas and values we oppose. We saw this enacted just this past week during the congressional impeachment debate, throughout which those opposing the president insisted the indisputable facts are on their side, while those supporting him insisted there are no facts incriminating him. I'm not saying that their respective arguments have the same weight. From my perspective, based on my ideologies and values, my biases and values, there is ample evidence the president used his office for political gain, and his defenders' arguments are usually illogical and baseless. But it's also obvious that the facts aren't important to them whether they existed or not, the only qualification necessary for his defenders is the fact that he is on their side. That's what makes him one of the good guys in their story. Most of you know I don't enjoy watching sports. But on the unusual occasion I end up at a football game, I more enjoy watching the bewildering antics of the fans. <laughs> when a referee throws a flag on a play in favor of their team, the crowd cheers uproariously. But when the same referee throws a flag against their team, they shout ad hominem attacks at him. Outrageous conspiracy theories. Are you blind? Whose side are you on? How much does your integrity cost? <laughs> Unfortunately, such incongruent thinking and open hostility isn't limited to films and games. 
nor to one side or the other. Some of you may have read David Brooks' column in the New York Times this week, The Politics of Exhaustion. He distinguishes between two political blocks in our nation, the proletariat and the precariat. The proletariat are the working class who are voters in support of Donald Trump because he says they see their best world receding and they want a tough guy to bring it back. The precariat, he says, are the young and educated voters caught in the gig economy who see no career or security ahead. Although there are some significant differences between them, Brooks says they also share much in common, especially an indifference about whether or not their side plays by the rules. Any flags thrown against their leaders are dismissed as forms of oppression and privilege by the precariat and with impossible conspiracy theories by the proletariat. Haunted by economic insecurity, Brooks writes, they will tolerate any sin in their leader, racism, anti-Semitism, dishonesty, so long as that person is willing to fight and be on their side. Fortunately, there aren't only two sides. Brooks ex estimates 75% of us are among a third camp that he calls the politically exhausted. They are simply worn out by the endless war between these two armies. Brooks says, exhaustion has become an independent force in modern politics. Many people are voting for whatever candidate will exhaust them less. <laughs> this may be why that term oligarchy is increasingly used to describe our nation, because it has become possible for a few people about 25% by his estimates, to rule over everyone else, be they in our government, or on our college campuses, or social media, or even in our churches and other social circles. The chief feature of the voters in the exhausted group is timidity, Brooks says. Their instinct is to keep their heads down and just get through this craziness. On campuses, 10% of students are able to intimidate the other 90% who don't want to say the wrong thing and get canceled. That's my sentiments exactly. <laughs> canceled means being digitally mobbed on social media and having your reputation and career ruined in seconds. Still, the divided oligarchs, the proletariat and precariat, aren't so good at defeating each other in this endless war, he says, but they are really good at intimidating the moderates on their own sides. Except for a few foolhardy individuals who refuse to let our society and its institutions go down this path without speaking up, the exhausted 75 percenters have learned it's best just to keep quiet. And feeling so certain they are on the right side, whichever side it is, far left or far right, and therefore don't have to obey the rules because the rules only apply to those who are on the wrong side. That's who the rules are for, right? They feel perfectly justified in destroying their perceived enemies, which they accomplish by dehumanizing them. This is the point of my title, The Dark Night of the Soul. Some of you may recall a Batman film in the film franchise entitled The Dark Knight. Like most superheroes, Batman almost always fights masked villains. By hiding their faces from us, we can't see their humanity. They are dehumanized. They become jokers and riddlers and penguins. 
It's the same in the Star in the Star Wars films. The human faces of its villains, Darth Vader and his stormtroopers, are hidden from our view. In Marvel's Captain America, the main villain has the face of a skeleton, and the faces of his army are always obscured by masks and helmets. Captain America's team, by contrast, all have their human faces exposed. Like all the stories we tell ourselves, the heroes are human, the villains are not. Not really. This little Hollywood trick allows us to watch our heroes kill their enemies by the hundreds without eliciting much empathy from us. If they're inhuman, why should we care? Other movies like James Bond and Rambo and the Taken films make their villains so inhuman in their behavior, so unimaginably heartless, so sadistic, that we likewise can't wait for them to get what's coming to them, no matter how violent and retributive it is. But again, this isn't about what happens in action movies and ball games, but about how we treat each other in real life. Too many of us think nothing of dehumanizing those we disagree with because having the right opinions and values makes us the real humans. Whether we're fighting to overthrow a tyrannical government or part of a government fighting to protect our freedoms against terrorists is inconsequential to how we see ourselves. Whichever side we're on, we're the human heroes of our story fighting against the inhumanity of our adversaries. That's why I like this Batman film, The Dark Knight, because it exposes this deception by making it clear that there is no difference between Batman and his adversaries. He too wears a mask that hides his humanity. His heart has been darkened by hatred for his enemies. His mind has gone insane with vengeance. And his idea of justice is to inflict violence and suffering on others. Batman and his enemies are the same. Their only difference is the side that they are on, the rightness and wrongness of which is determined by which side is telling the story. In real life, whether it's those on the right that humanizing their adversaries by labeling them liberals, radical leftists, communists, and so on, or those on the left using social media to dismiss their adversaries as racist, homophobic, transphobic, and the like, the behavior is the same. In her new book, Don't Label Me, Ershad Manji writes of the penance for going rogue in the social justice movements, shaming, scolding, isolating, and eviscerating someone's social standing. Manji, who is herself non-white, Muslim, and gay, who would chastise me for labeling her, is quoting a blogger named Francis Lee, who wrote of their willingness to be excommunicated from the Church of Social Justice. Lee, who identifies as a queer, trans person of color, and already left fundamentalist Christianity, couldn't abide the equally disturbing dogma that has polluted justice movements. Punishment has been used for all of history to control and destroy people, they say. Why is it being used in movements meant to liberate all of us? I know the feeling. Just a couple days after I gave away my controversial book and was banned from the General Assembly last June, the Spokesman Review wrote an article about the event mentioning a letter written by more than 300 of my ministerial colleagues accusing me of being racist, homophobic, transphobic, and ableist without having had time to read my book. 
as unjust and unfounded as these labels are, in my opinion, I've been defending myself against them ever since, against members of my own liberal community, some of whom have known me for years. But as Manji explains, nowadays imperious individuals pretending to speak for all liberals intimidate decent people into clamming up. And there's that word again, intimidation. Yet for better or for worse, I'm not one among the 75% willing to clam up under pressure. Only a short time later at the Freedom in the Arboretum annual 4th of July event, our conservative Republican Sheriff Ozzy Nezovich began addressing the crowd. Be careful not to demonize people, he said, because once you demonize someone, you can easily dehumanize them. And once you dehumanize someone, you feel justified in doing, doing whatever you want to them. After taking a bit more time to talk about how easy it is to dehumanize people on social media these days, precisely because we don't have to see their faces, isn't that an irony? Facebook defaces us. like the villains in Batman and Captain America. He said, when I saw the name of a friend of mine mentioned in the paper last week, I thought, man, if this guy's a racist, what hope is there for the rest of us? He then looked directly at me and said, you know who you are. You know what you're about. I know it hurts. But don't, don't let them get you down. Just keep being who you are and doing what you do. I have to admit I was deeply touched to have a man who I've been publicly at odds with on some issues extend a level of support even some of my friends haven't. Afterward, I went to thank him, and he hugged me. He said, I know how it is, Todd. Sometimes it feels like they're ripping the heart right out of your chest. But you just keep doing what you believe is right. You know who you are. Hold on to that. Sheriff Ozzy and I may not agree on some things, but we both value the humanity of others, including those who think differently than we do. Ozzy embraces my humanity even though we have differences, even as many of my liberal colleagues immediately began dehumanizing me for a book they had not read. I also embrace and recognize Ozzy's humanity, and I am glad that we can disagree and still be friends. That's the way it should be. That's what Unitarian Universalism is supposed to be about. Not thinking alike, but love alike. But like I said, every story needs a protagonist and an antagonist. And it always feels better if we're on the hero's side being charitable to those we disagree with, loving our perceived enemies, humanizing them, relating to them, is hard work. Reducing them to a label is so much easier and makes us feel so much better about ourselves in the process. But as the Tao Te Ching says, when people see some things as good, other things become bad. When we see ourselves as good, other people become bad. And the more we convince ourselves of our righteousness, the worse they become and the worse they deserve.
That sounds more interesting. <laughs> oh, that's John. So John, sorry to call you out, buddy. That's an interesting ringtone. That's an interesting ringtone, though. It's like a whole lecture. It takes you a long time to answer the phone. <laughs> it's okay. It's okay. No, no worries. No worries. Today, those of us on the left often stake our claim to the righteous side beneath the banner of diversity, which is a good banner. Part of our church's mission, right? So long as our actions don't make us indistinguishable from our adversaries in its name. Certainly some people disagree with our progressive camp because of racism and homophobia and transphobia and, and so forth. But labeling everyone in this way just because they disagree with us is cruel and it's cowardly. Now my phone's going off. Man. As Manji puts it, some people oppose diversity because they are bigots. Others, though, are skeptical of diversity because of how we, its champions, practice it. We're fixated on labeling. And labeling drains diversity of its unifying potential. But these days it's become easier than ever to label and dehumanize others by using social media. As Guy Harrison says in his book, Think Before You Like. Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter users know that great power is always at their fingertips and the fingertips of others. With a simple click, they can banish or be banished from a community forever. No wonder the politically exhausted are so easily intimidated into keeping their mouths shut or coerced even into joining those digital mobs so that they don't appear to be suspect. Exiling was a common practice in some ancient societies, Harrison says, some viewed it as a fate worse than death. And here we are again, today. People are exiled from social media tribes every moment. Every moment. Not long after the 9-11 attacks, President George W. Bush said, over time, it's going to be important for our nations to know they will be held accountable for inactivity. You're either with us or against us in the fight on terror. That's often the sentiment of the dark night. That you're either for us or against us, and if you're against us, you're a faceless, inhuman villain who deserves what's coming. It's a sentiment, oddly enough, attributed to Jesus in the Gospel of Matthew. But it simply doesn't jive with the rest of his message and is corrected in the Gospels of Mark and Luke. What he really said, according to their accounts, is whoever is not against us is for us. Almost the opposite of the misquote. And like much of what else Jesus said goes against the status quo. Simply disagreeing with us doesn't make others our enemies. Just because they fail to join our cause or because they think differently or speak differently or act differently than we do doesn't make us adversaries. If they aren't actively working to do us harm, People are not our enemies. We don't have to fear everyone who is different. It's okay to have differences. It's okay to think differently. We can still be on each other's side 
if we disagree. Because agreement isn't what binds human relationships. If that is what healing means, never disagreeing, we're in trouble. It's respecting each other enough to embrace our differences that defines, defines what it means to love one another. Thank you. Please rise in body or spirit for our closing hymn, number 323, Break Not the Circle. marvelous season of light when the whole world unites to uphold the concepts of goodwill and rebirth breathing the divine light. Namaste. Amen. Blessed be. Salam alaikum and shalom. <laughs> Thank you.